Well, <laughs> Jerry has provided me with this very concise introduction. <laughs> Here's so, Jerry. Jerry Dixon's speech is entitled "When Does Wrong When Does Wrong Become Right?" Jerry Dixon, "When Does Wrong Become Right?" Jerry. Thank you. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters. I would like for each one of you to ask yourself this question: If someone or a group of people are committing a wrongful act, but they have a lot of people supporting them, when does the addition of one more supporter turn that wrongful act into a rightful act? I think that's an intriguing political social hypothesis, and I'm going to demonstrate that concept to you tonight using the following example. Let's say someone knocks on your door. You go to answer, it's a person standing there, and they say, give me your money and they have some kind of weapon to force you to comply. I think we can all agree that that's wrong. But let's say two people knock on your door and they say, we want you to give us your money. However, we're going to use democratic principles to determine whether or not you should give us your money. We're going to have a vote. The vote comes out two to one. Sorry, you lost. So the question is, does the fact that you have some say in the matter turn this wrongful act into a rightful act? Now let's say 10 people knock on your door and say, give us your money. They say, no, wait, we're going to use this money to do some good things with. We're going to keep some for ourselves, but most of the money is going to go to help other people who really need it. So does that make you feel better? Does that make it a right thing to do? Or would you rather determine your own charity? Now let's say 100 people knock on your door and say, give us your money. And they say, now wait a minute, we're going to come back later and give you back some of your own money. Well, that's nice of them. So it's the fact that they're taking your money now and with the promise of later, you're going to get some of it back. Does that change anything? Does that make it better? Does that make it right? Or is it still wrong? Now let's say a thousand people knock on your door and say, give us your money. Now you may start to question yourself. If those thousand people honestly believe that I should give them my money, and it's just little old me saying no, is it possible that maybe they're right and I'm wrong? Now let's say 10,000 people knock on your door and say, give us your money. But they say, now don't feel like we're singling you out. We're taking money from everybody. We're taking money from all of your neighbors. So does the fact that they're stealing money from everybody, justify stealing money from you. Now let's say 100,000 people knock on your door and demand that you give them your money. But they kind of sense that you're still not feeling good about this because you're looking at what they're doing as theft. So they say, from now on, we're going to change the name of what we're doing. From now on, instead of calling it a theft, we're going to call it a tax. Is that what turns wrong into right? Calling it something that sounds better? Does that make you feel good about it? So is it starting to smell better or does it still stink? <laughs> does the fact that everybody's doing it make it right? If they're stealing from everybody, does that justify stealing from you? Does that make theft a rightful act? I called the IRS on the phone the other day, and their answering machine, or their voicemail said, please hold, all of our agents are helping other customers. They want us to think we're their customers doing business with them. 
which makes me want to take my business to their competition, whoever that is. Now let's look at this for what it really is. I looked up the word theft in the dictionary, and it said the taking of someone's property without their consent. Isn't that what's really happening here? Now, if you freely pay money that you're not obligated to pay, then that's fine. Otherwise, I think you're a victim of theft. If you're goaded into doing it, you're forced into doing it some way that you don't really want to pay. Now, if you don't believe that taxation is theft, then show me the contract that you signed agreeing to pay a certain amount of money and the government agreed to do certain things for you. I know I never signed any such contract. Same thing with Social Security. I never agreed to participate in this retirement plan they have going. Social Security just snuck its way into my life and I got my first paycheck as a teenager. I just got used to it and figured this is just something you have to do. And then later in life, I started asking myself, why am I paying for something I never agreed to? Something which nobody seems to like. Something which, it turns out, is a Ponzi scheme. And like all Ponzi schemes, they eventually run out of money. The reason this one has lasted so long is because there's so many people involved in it. But it eventually will. Now, I have been a tax preparer for over 30 years. And I do feel somewhat like a traitor to my own beliefs. On the other hand, I'm helping people pay the minimum tax they possibly can. And I see the IRS as an organized crime family. When an organized crime family is after you, you can't just ignore them or they will destroy you. You have to deal with them in some way to keep them off of your back. And I know a lot of people who income taxes, where all taxes are their biggest expense in their, in their life. People are paying in a fourth, a third, a half of their income in the taxes. How much is enough? If you pay 40% federal income tax, 10% state income tax, 3% Medicare tax, that's 53%. And when your income gets up to a certain level, every dollar you make past that gets taxed at 53%, which is a big disincentive to making more money if you're going to be able to keep less than half of it. Now that we know what the problem is, question is, what can we do about it? 2013 is the 100th anniversary of the income tax. The very first tax form was the 1913 tax form. And income taxes, Social Security tax, and Medicare tax, these were all put into place by Republicans and Democrats. And 100 years later, they're still in love with these taxes. So we can't look to them for any help. That's the fox guarding the hen house. Einstein once said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over while expecting different results. And as long as we keep reelecting Republicans and Democrats, we're not going to see any significant change. The only political party that is actively seeking to repeal these taxes is the Libertarian Party. Write down these five letters. LP.org. Go to the website, see if you agree with what they believe, and if you do, join up, and then start voting Libertarian. And eventually, when enough people choose to vote for liberty, 
then we will someday have financial freedom. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Jerry. Very compelling. Very